Chapter two, part two of Winds of Doctrine Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter two Christianity and Modernism, part two. Modernism is the infiltration into minds that begin by being Catholic and wish to remain so of two contemporary influences one the rationalistic study of the bible and of church history the other modern philosophy especially in its mystical and idealistic forms the sensitiveness of the modernists to these two influences is creditable to them as men however perturbing it may be to them as catholics for what makes them adopt the views of rationalistic historians is simply the fact that those views seem in substance convincingly true and what makes them wander into transcendental speculations is the warmth of their souls needing to express their faith anew and to follow their inmost inspiration wherever it may lead them a scrupulous honesty in admitting the probable facts of history and a fresh upwelling of mystical experience these are the motives creditable to any spiritual man that have made modernists of so many but these excellent things appear in the modernists under rather unfortunate circumstances for the modernists to begin with are catholics and usually priests they are pledged to a fixed creed touching matters both of history and of philosophy and it would be a marvel if rationalistic criticism of the bible and rationalistic church history confirmed that creed on its historical side or if irresponsible personal speculations in the manner of richel or of bergson confirmed its metaphysics i am far from wishing to suggest that an orthodox christian cannot be scrupulously honest in admitting the probable facts or cannot have a fresh spiritual experience or frame an original philosophy but what we think probable hangs on our standard of probability and of evidence the spiritual experiences that come to us are according to our disposition and affections and any new philosophy we frame will be an answer to the particular problems that beset us and an expression of the solutions we hope for now this standard of probability this disposition and these problems and hopes may be those of a christian or they may not the true christian for instance will begin by regarding miracles as probable he will either believe he has experienced them in his own person or hope for them earnestly nothing will seem to him more natural more in consonance with the actual texture of life than that they should have occurred abundantly and continuously in the past when he finds the record of one he will not inquire like the rationalist how that false record could have been concocted but rather he will ask how the rationalist in spite of so many witnesses to the contrary has acquired his fixed assurance of the universality of the commonplace an answer perhaps could be offered of which the rationalist need not be ashamed we might say that faith in the universality of the commonplace in its origin no doubt simply an imaginative presumption is justified by our systematic mastery of matter in the arts the rejection of miracles a priori expresses a conviction that the laws by which we can always control or predict the movement of matter govern that movement universally and evidently if the material course of history is fixed mechanically the mental and moral course of it is thereby fixed on the same plan for a mind not expressed somehow in matter cannot be revealed to the historian this may be good philosophy but we could not think so if we were good christians we should then expect to move matter by prayer rationalistic history and criticism are therefore based as pius x most accurately observed in his encyclical on modernism on rationalistic philosophy and we might add that rationalistic philosophy is based on practical art and that practical art by which we help ourselves like prometheus and make instruments of what religion worships when this art is carried beyond the narrowest bounds is the essence of pride and irreligion miners machinists and artisans are irreligious by trade religion is the love of life in the consciousness of impotence similarly the spontaneous insight of christians and their new philosophies will express a christian disposition the chief problems in them will be sin and redemption the conclusion will be some fresh intuition of divine love and heavenly beatitude it would be no sign of originality in a christian 
to begin discoursing on love like ovid or on heaven like mohammed or stop discoursing on them at all it would be a sign of apostasy now the modernist criterion of probability in history or of worthiness in philosophy is not the christian criterion it is that of the contemporaries outside the church who are rationalists in history and egotists or voluntarists in philosophy the biblical criticism and mystical speculations of the modernists call for no special remark they are such as any studious or spiritual person with no inherited religion might compose in our day but what is remarkable and well-nigh incredible is that even for a moment they should have supposed this non-christian criterion in history and this non-christian direction in metaphysics compatible with adherence to the catholic church that seems to presuppose in men who in fact are particularly thoughtful and learned an inexplicable ignorance of history of theology and of the world everything however has its explanation in a catholic seminary as the modernists bitterly complain very little is heard of the views held in the learned world outside it is not taught there that the christian religion is only one of many some of them older and superior to it in certain respects that it itself is eclectic and contains inward contradictions that it is and always has been divided into rancorous sects that its position in the world is precarious and its future hopeless on the contrary everything is so presented as to persuade the innocent student that all that is good or true anywhere is founded on the faith he is preparing to preach that the historical evidences of its truth are irrefragable that it is logically perfect and spiritually all-sufficing these convictions which no breath from the outside is allowed to ruffle are deepened in the case of pensive and studious minds like those of the leading modernists by their own religious experience they understand in what they are taught more perhaps than their teachers intend they understand how those ideas originated they can trace a similar revelation in their own lives this which a cynic might expect would be the beginning of disillusion only deepens their religious faith and gives it a wider basis report and experience seem to conspire but trouble is brewing here for a report that can be confirmed by experience can also be enlarged by it and it is easy to see in traditional revelation itself many diverse sources different temperaments and different types of thought have left their impress upon it yet other temperaments and other types of thought might continue the task revelation seems to be progressive a part may fall to us also to furnish this insight for a christian has its dangers no doubt it gives him a key to the understanding and therefore in one sense to the acceptance of many a dogma christian dogmas were not pieces of wanton information fallen from heaven they were imaginative views expressing now some primordial instinct in all men now the national hopes and struggles of israel now the moral or dialectical philosophy of the later jews and greeks such a derivation does not of itself render these dogmas necessarily mythical they might be ideal expressions of human experience and yet be literally true as well provided we assume what is assumed throughout in christianity that the world is made for man and that even god is just such a god as man would have wished him to be the existent ideal of human nature and the foregone solution to all human problems nevertheless christian dogmas are definite while human inspirations are potentially limitless and if the object of the two is identical either the dogmas must be stretched and ultimately abandoned or inspiration which does not conform to them must be denounced as illusory or diabolical footnote two at least in their devotional and moral import i suggest this qualification in deference to m le roy's interesting theory of dogma that is that the verbal or intellectual definition of a dogma may be changed without changing the dogma itself as a sentence might be translated into a new language without altering the meaning provided the suggested conduct and feeling in the presence of the mystery remain the same thus the definition of transubstantiation might be modified to suit an idealistic philosophy but the new definition would be no less orthodox than the old if it did not discourage the worship of the consecrated elements or the sense of mystical union with christ in the sacrament End of footnote two. 
at this point the modernist first chooses the path which must lead him away steadily and forever from the church which he did not think to desert he chooses a personal psychological variable standard of inspiration he becomes in principle a protestant why does he not become one in name also because as one of the most distinguished modernists has said the age of partial heresy is past it is suicidal to make one part of an organic system the instrument for attacking another part and it is also comic what you appeal to and stand firmly rooted in is no more credible no more authoritative than what you challenge in its name in vain will you pit the church against the pope at once you will have to pit the bible against the church and then the new testament against the old or the genuine jesus against the new testament or god revealed in nature against god revealed in the bible or god revealed in your own conscience or transcendental self against god revealed in nature and you will be lucky if your conscience and transcendental self can long hold their own against the flux of immediate experience religion the modernists feel must be taken broadly and sympathetically as a great human historical symbol for the truth at least in christianity you should aspire to embrace and express the whole to seize it in its deep inward sources and follow it on all sides in its vital development but if the age of partial heresy is past has not the age of total heresy succeeded what is this whole phenomenon of religion but human experience interpreted by human imagination and what is the modernist who would embrace it all but a free thinker with a sympathetic interest in religious illusions of course that is just what he is but it takes him a strangely long time to discover it he fondly supposes such is the prejudice imbibed by him in the cradle and in the seminary that all human inspirations are necessarily similar and concurrent that by trusting in inward light he cannot be led away from his particular religion but on the contrary can only find confirmation for it together with fresh spiritual energies he has been reared in profound ignorance of other religions which were presented to him if at all only in grotesque caricature or if anything good had to be admitted in them it was set down to a premonition of his own system or a derivation from it a curious conceit which seems somehow not to have wholly disappeared from the minds of protestants or even of professors of philosophy i need not observe how completely the secret of each alien religion is thereby missed and its native accent outraged the most serious consequence for the modernist of this unconsciousness of whatever is not christian is an unconsciousness of what in contrast to other religions christianity itself is he feels himself full of love except for the pope of mysticism and of a sort of archaeological piety he is learned and eloquent and wistful why should he not remain in the church why should he not bring all its cold and recalcitrant members up to his own level of insight the modernist like the protestants before him is certainly justified in contrasting a certain essence or true life of religion with the formulas and practices not all equally well chosen which have crystallized round it in the routine of catholic teaching and worship there is notoriously a deal of mummery phrases and ceremonies abound that have lost their meaning and that people run through without even that general devout attitude and unction which after all is all that can be asked for in the presence of mysteries not only is all sense of the historical or moral basis of dogma wanting but the dogma itself is hardly conceived explicitly all is dispatched with a stock phrase or a quotation from some theological compendium ecclesiastical authority acts as if it felt that more profundity would be confusing and that more play of mind might be dangerous this is that scholasticism and medievalism against which the modernists inveigh or under which they groan and to this intellectual barrenness may be added the offences against taste verisimilitude and justice which their more critical minds may discern in many an act and pronouncement of their official superiors thus both their sense for historical truth and their spontaneous mysticism drive the modernists to contrast with the official religion what was pure and vital in the religion of their fathers like the early protestants they wished to revert to a more genuine christianity but while their historical imagination is much more accurate and well fed than that of any one in the sixteenth century could be 
they have no hold on the protestant principle of faith the protestants taking the bible as an oracle which personal inspiration was to interpret could reform tradition in any way and to any extent which their reason or feeling happened to prompt but so long as their christianity was a positive faith the residue when all the dross had been criticized and burned away was of divine authority the bible never became for them merely an ancient jewish encyclopedia often eloquent often curious and often barbarous god never became a literary symbol covering some problematical cosmic force or some ideal of the conscience but for the modernist this total transformation takes place at once he keeps the whole catholic system but he believes in no part of it as it demands to be believed he understands and shares the moral experience that it enshrines but the bubble has been pricked the painted world has been discovered to be but painted he has ceased to be a christian to become an amateur or if you will a connoisseur of christianity he believes and this unquestioningly for he is a child of his age in history in philology in evolution perhaps in german idealism he does not believe in sin nor in salvation nor in revelation his study of history has disclosed christianity to him in its evolution and in its character of a myth he wishes to keep it in its entirety precisely because he regards it as a convention like a language or a school of art whereas the protestants wished on the contrary to reduce it to its original substance because they fondly supposed that that original substance was so much literal truth modernism is accordingly an ambiguous and unstable thing it is the love of all christianity in those who perceive that it is all a fable it is the historic attachment to his church of a catholic who has discovered that he is a pagan when the modernists are pressed to explain their apparently double allegiance they end by saying that what historical and philological criticism conjectures to be the facts must be accepted as such while the christian dogmas touching these things the incarnation and resurrection of christ for instance must be taken in a purely symbolic or moral sense in saying this they may be entirely right it seems to many of us that christianity is indeed a fable yet full of meaning if you take it as such for what scraps of historical truth there may be in the bible or metaphysical truth in theology are of little importance whilst the true greatness and beauty of this as of all religions is to be found in its moral idealism i mean in the expression it gives under cover of legends prophecies or mysteries of the effort the tragedy and the consolations of human life such a moral fable is what christianity is in fact but it is far from what it is in intention the modernist view the view of a sympathetic rationalism revokes the whole jewish tradition on which christianity is grafted it takes the seriousness out of religion it sweetens the pang of sin which becomes misfortune it removes the urgency of salvation it steals empirical reality away from the last judgment from hell and from heaven it steals historical reality away from the christ of religious tradition and personal devotion the moral summons and the prophecy about destiny which were the soul of the gospel have lost all force for it and become fables the modernist then starts with the orthodox but untenable persuasion that catholicism comprehends all that is good he adds the heterodox though amiable sentiment that any well-meaning ambition of the mind any hope any illumination any science must be good and therefore compatible with catholicism he bathes himself in idealistic philosophy he dabbles in liberal politics he accepts and emulates rationalistic exegesis in anti-clerical church history soon he finds himself on every particular point out of sympathy with the acts and tendencies of the church to which he belongs and then he yields to the most pathetic of his many illusions he sets about to purge this church so as not to be compelled to abandon it to purge it of its first principles of its whole history and of its sublime if chimerical ideal the modernist wishes to reconcile the church and the world therein he forgets what christianity came into the world to announce and why its message was believed it came to announce salvation from the world there should be no more need of just those things which the modernist so deeply loves and respects and blushes that his church should not be adorned with emancipated science free poetic religion optimistic politics and dissolute art 
these things according to the christian conscience were all vanity and vexation of spirit and the pagan world itself almost confessed as much they were vexatious and vain because they were bred out of sin out of ignoring the inward and the revealed law of god and they would lead surely and quickly to destruction the needful salvation from these follies christianity went on to announce had come through the cross of christ whose grace together with admission to his future heavenly kingdom was offered freely to such as believed in him separated themselves from the world and lived in charity humility and innocence waiting lamp in hand for the celestial bridegroom these abstracted and elected spirits were the true disciples of christ and the church itself having no ears for this essential message of christianity the modernist also has no eyes for its history the church converted the world only partially and inessentially yet christianity was outwardly established as the traditional religion of many nations and why because although the prophecies it relied on were strained and its miracles dubious it furnished a needful sanctuary from the shames sorrows injustices violence and gathering darkness of earth and not only a sanctuary one might fly to but a holy precinct where one might live where there was sacred learning based on revelation and tradition to occupy the inquisitive and sacred philosophy to occupy the speculative where there might be religious art ministering to the faith and a new life in the family or in the cloister transformed by a permeating spirit of charity sacrifice soberness and prayer these principles by their very nature could not become those of the world but they could remain in it as a leaven and an ideal as such they remain to this day and very efficaciously in the catholic church the modernists talk a great deal of development and they do not see that what they detest in the church is a perfect development of its original essence that monarchism scholasticism jesuitism ultramontanism and vaticanism are all thoroughly apostolic beneath the overtones imposed by a series of ages they give out the full and exact note of the new testament much has been added but nothing has been lost development though those who talk most of it seem to forget it is not the same as flux and dissolution it is not a continuity through changes of any sort but the evolution of something latent and preformed or else the creation of new instruments of defence for the same original life in this sense there was an immense development of christianity during the first three centuries and this development has continued more slowly ever since but only in the roman church for the eastern churches have refused themselves all new expressions while the protestant churches have eaten more and more into the core it is a striking proof of the preservative power of readjustment that the roman church in the midst of so many external transformations as it has undergone still demands the same kind of faith that john the baptist demanded i mean faith in another world the mise en scene has changed immensely the gospel has been encased in theology in ritual in ecclesiastical authority in conventional forms of charity like some small bone of a saint in a gilded reliquary but the relic for once is genuine and the gospel have been preserved by those thick incrustations many an isolated fanatic or evangelical missionary in the slums shows a greater resemblance to the apostles in his outer situation than the pope does but what mind healer or revivalist nowadays preaches the doom of the natural world in its vanity or the reversal of animal values or the blessedness of poverty and chastity or the inferiority of natural human bonds or a contempt for lay philosophy yet in his palace full of pagan marbles the pope actually preaches all this it is here and certainly not among the modernists that the gospel is still believed of course it is open to any one to say that there is a nobler religion possible without these trammels and this officialdom that there is a deeper philosophy than this supernaturalistic rationalism that there is a sweeter life than this legal piety perhaps i think the pagan greeks the buddhists the mohammedans would have much to say for themselves before the impartial tribunal of human nature and reason but they are not christians and do not wish to be no more in their hearts are the modernists and they should feel it beneath their dignity to pose as such indeed the most sensitive of them already feel it to say they are not christians at heart but diametrically opposed to the fundamental faith and purpose of christianity is not to say that they may not be profound mystics 
as many hindus jews and pagan greeks have been or excellent scholars or generous philanthropists but the very motive that attaches them to christianity is worldly and unchristian they wish to preserve the continuity of moral traditions they wish the poetry of life to flow down to them uninterruptedly and copiously from all the ages it is an amiable and wise desire but it shows that they are men of the renaissance pagan and pantheistic in their profounder sentiment to whom the hard and narrow realism of official christianity is offensive just because it presupposes that christianity is true yet even in this historical and poetical allegiance to christianity i suspect the modernists suffer from a serious illusion they think the weakness of the church lies in its not following the inspirations of the age but when this age is past might not that weakness be a source of strength again for an idea ever to be fashionable is ominous since it must afterwards be always old-fashioned no doubt it would be dishonest in any of us now who see clearly that noah surely did not lead all the animals two by two into the ark to say that we believe he did so on the ground that stories of that kind are rather favourable to the spread of religion no doubt such a story and even the fables essential to christian theology are now incredible to most of us but on the other hand it would be stupid to assume that what is incredible to you or me now must always be incredible to mankind what was foolishness to the greeks of st paul's day spread mightily among them one or two hundred years later and what is foolishness to the modernist of to-day may edify future generations the imagination is suggestible and there is nothing men will not believe in matters of religion these rational persuasions by which we are swayed the conventions of unbelieving science and unbelieving history are superficial growths yesterday they did not exist to-morrow they may have disappeared this is a doctrine which the modernist philosophers themselves emphasize as does bergson whom some of them follow and say the catholic church itself ought to follow in order to be saved for prophets are constitutionally without a sense of humour these philosophers maintain that intelligence is merely a convenient method of picking one's way through the world of matter that it is a falsification of life and wholly unfit to grasp the roots of it we may well be of another opinion if we think the roots of life are not in consciousness but in nature which intelligence alone can reveal but we must agree that in life itself intelligence is a superficial growth and easily blighted and that the experience of the vanity of the world of sin of salvation of miracles of strange revelations and of mystic loves is a far deeper more primitive and therefore probably more lasting human possession than is that of clear historical or scientific ideas now religious experience as i have said may take other forms than the christian and within christianity it may take other forms than the catholic but the catholic form is as good as any intrinsically for the devotee himself and it has immense advantages over its probable rivals in charm in comprehensiveness in maturity in internal rationality in external adaptability so much so that a strong anti-clerical government like the french cannot safely leave the church to be overwhelmed by the forces of science good sense ridicule frivolity and avarice all strong forces in france but must use violence as well to do it in the english church too it is not those who accept the deluge the resurrection and the sacraments only as symbols that are the vital party but those who accept them literally for only these have anything to say to the poor or to the rich that can refresh them in a frank supernaturalism in a tight clericalism not in a pleasant secularization lies the sole hope of the church its sole dignity also lies there it will not convert the world it never did and it never could it will remain a voice crying in the wilderness but it will believe what it cries and there will be some to listen to it in the future as there have been many in the past as to modernism it is suicide it is the last of those concessions to the spirit of the world which half-believers and double-minded prophets have always been found making but it is a mortal concession it concedes everything for it concedes that everything in christianity as christians hold it is an illusion end of chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine